Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie And you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Friday Night Racing It's Jerry Gilroy and Johnny Ward with you in studio back live in glorious Technicolor for this week's edition as ever, if you want to get in touch with us, you can uh, text us during the evening on 53106 or you can uh, get us on Twitter at Off The Ball. We broadcast live every Friday afternoon across OTB social channels and then every Friday evening from 8 o'clock on Off The Ball on News Talk. Johnny, it's finally here. The Dumb Racing Festival is upon us. Finally here with a crowd. Um, David Jennings may have been slightly exaggerating things in the race post to say the last two years have been hell. Um, compare that to North Korean slave labour camp. I'd say watching racing behind closed doors probably isn't hell, Ger. But I know what he means. I'm it's glad. I'm glad you're mates with him anyway. Yeah, yeah. The general know what I'm saying. Um, but uh, yeah, because like even even Leopard Son of Christmas was it was really disappointing that there was no one there. I mean, and uh, this is uh, like we were going to have it. That was the worst part. It was, yeah, uh, kind of. It was last again, minute. Off again. It was like I think it was Christmas Eve. They called it off. But with the rugby on, um, reports of Welsh people looking for points early today in, in in you know on Friday in Dublin, the rugby on and the Dublin Race Festival like there was always that kind of symmetry between the rugby and this meeting um, and even before that the good racing around this time of year would, would, would kind of clash with the rugby and you'd be encouraged to go racing to watch the rugby but essentially Dublin will be buzzing tomorrow Leopard Sound will be buzzing and uh, we've loads of great ones to get our proverbial teeth into and we'll get stuck into them in just a little while I guess this week though does actually have a, an interest particularly in uh, one of those, uh, Master McShee is running with a decent chance and a brilliant story behind it. And I'm delighted to say Paddy Corkery is with us live. Paddy, in glorious technical yourself, how are you? Good, Jock. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're very excited to hear your backstory. Um, is it true you only got into racing in your 40s? Yeah, I suppose I started hunting in my 40s. I could be late 30s or 40s. And, but I was always involved in some kind of sport. I nearly played hurling till I was 50. So I kept that sport all the time and I always enjoyed sport. It's it's interesting to like, um, we'll we'll get into your 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 uh, profession and all that kind of stuff in a moment. But you, you, your connection with racing seems to have been kind of tangential enough. Or you weren't actually you weren't born into a racing family or anything, were you? No, not really. No, no, no. Uh, I suppose hunting was my first interest with horses, and um, you know I liked horses, and I used to ride them out. And I said, you know what, I might get a race horse and see how we get on. I did that and. It's I got the buzz, the bug for it really, and I stayed at it then, you know. And so, when you said get get a horse, were you intending to be a trainer from the get go? Was that like I'll get a horse and train it and see if we can enter it in races? <laughs> well, I've often said this about horse racing, and I say it about a lot of things. And I used to find I need, I like to be hands on, and I found with horses it, it, to, to be like buying a set of golf clubs and giving them to someone else to play with them. You know, I just wanted to be hands-on and I liked that job and I liked to be part of it, you know? Right. So, did you know what you were doing when you went to buy your first horse? Like, were you, you kind of had enough of an understanding of how the industry worked or did you just kind of rock up one day and go, geez, how, how does this actually work? Not really, I suppose. You know, I, keep, I was keeping an eye on the, the, the guys that were doing the job properly and I kind of stepped at it myself, made plenty of mistakes. And them to have them, maybe you know. Right. And how many when you when you started out? How many did you have at the beginning? Just one. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's all the eggs in this one basket then. Well, at the start, yeah, I was just have one horse that time, and I used to ride them out myself. And you know, you you learn about how to get them fit and how to get them fresh and how to keep them right, and you know. We've been talking about that that specific aspect of it with every trainer we have on. And that seems to be the magic part of it, is knowing when the horse is ready to race and knowing when you have to ease off because you're doing too much. So it's obviously trial and error from your perspective with just the one horse. Well, very much so on the start, but as you get on with horses, you, you kind of learn their personality. And every horse has a different personality and they probably tell you a lot by how much they eat and when they eat and when they're rolling and all that kind of stuff and they're happy when they're doing that, you know? Yeah, so uh, were you successful with your first horse? He won a pint of pint. Right, great. Uh, but I couldn't get him to eat and I tried every trick in the book. <laughs> but he just wouldn't eat. And maybe my second horse, then, it was a mare that I bought off the time I cat. It was very successful. Well, she was running under other people's names, but I did most of the work myself, you know? Right, very good. And so... 
she obviously won races for you, did she? She won seven times and she was placed 14. Wow, holy moly, you must be thinking, this is great, I, I've got this cracked. I have cracked it. And the other thing, of course, was, you know, it's, it's not alone, it, it, it's about look. And every aspect of a horse is look and a gamble. And if you have the look and you're lucky, it, it just pays off, you know? Well, obviously, I, 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 my favourite story is the... I've actually completely butchered it now, but which of the golfers was the luckier? I, I, the more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, look goes a certain amount, but you must be able to tick the boxes as well. And look, the other thing that we always talk about with trainers is knowing which races to enter your horse into. That that takes... You've got to place them in the right company to make sure that they're up against a field that they can win in. How did you acquire that skill? Well, you get out the calendars and you... I, I, then the night go by that I don't look yet this race might suit the horse or that race might suit the horse and I look at the ratings and figure it out and just say you know So you had the point to pointer first and then you had the mayor that was very successful at, at, at any point are you thinking I might add a few more horses to this or is, is one well, I've, had a go- I've had a few in between now Right okay And uh, you know the biggest problem with a horse is maybe the word maybe is a huge thing with a horse and you get a horse there, you get him ready, and you run him, and then you say, um, he runs a stink, and you say, maybe I should run him in longer distance. Then, maybe I should run him in better ground. Then I should, maybe I should put him over fences. Maybe I should put him over hurdles. And after about 20 runs, you say to yourself, maybe the second is useless. <laughs> 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 you sound like you'd be good dealing with syndicates anyway <laughs> well I suppose you see the biggest thing about when you're training for yourself if you're not honest with yourself and get rid of a horse that's not showing enough mm. that's that's kind of the secret if if you think of a horse that's good enough you know I had another horse there now called Chancet mm. and he was a superstar at home but the day he went racing I think he'd prefer being in the pub because he never went to run it, it, uh, it's mad Paddy the amount of horses are like that you hear time time again morning glory just whatever it is goes racing doesn't do it well you know it's, it's something similar I train teams on the radio you go down there to the local field and, and you're training under 16 or a mile and you say I can't wait to see this guy playing in the championship and the day of the championship you can't find him mm. you just don't want to know you know and it's just the same with horses the day it gets a little bit tough they might not want to know Master McPhee isn't like that anyway. No, and I suppose the other thing with me is, you know, and I said this to Jane Mangan the other day, the other thing with me is he gets such a variety. If they're good, they get a real variety because maybe Monday I might go to the beach. Mm. Uh, Tuesday I'd probably go to Brian Hallens as a local gallop. Wednesday I'd go to Coromore. Maybe Thursday I'd go to Kylie's Cross Jumping. I might go to uh, Michal Griffins. And, you know, I said to Jane, when I put the horse into the box, he don't know where he's going. Mm. And, and some days maybe I don't do mm. that. Because <laughs> it's funny, like I've asked, um, I think I asked Patrick Mullins one day, what's the secret to Willie's success? And he said routine. Um, and I, I that didn't I, I, don't, I just didn't stick right with me because like I, I, I would have thought horses kind of after a while they do get fed up they're doing the same thing the whole time as well well I suppose you see you can do what I'm doing but still have routine so routine mm. means you go to the beach at 9 o'clock mm. routine means you go jumping at 9 o'clock you feed them at 1 o'clock you, you know what I mean so it's still routine but it's variety Mm. The other thing, the significant difference is the numbers. You, you can you can decide what you're going to do on a whim. Uh, am I right in saying that Master McShee is, is uh, the only horse you have in the yard at the moment? No, I have two more. Well, I have three or four more, but I have three in training, Master McShee and two younger stock. Okay, okay. And and you're you're flexible enough with those numbers that you can decide on a whim. Okay, well, sure, today we'll go, uh, we'll go to the beach. Well, no, to be honest, I... I figure out in my mind we'll say I'm going to go here Monday here Tuesday here Wednesday right. so I kind of plan out the week before I do anything you know? yeah fair enough um, I, and maybe that's the, the the other thing is that you, the gift of knowing the horse so intimately that you can ease off or you can go a bit harder if you need to yeah, and I think that's a big thing and to be honest Jimmy Maloney he's, he'll call him my works rider and 
you know, he say he's blowing a bit half today and I do a little bit more and maybe he's right, I do a bit, a bit, a bit less and, you know. The story, like, I, I love the story of the individual horse and the background to him. So, like, when he made his debut, 2nd of March 2020, um, a lot of people wouldn't have heard of uh, Paddy Corker. He certainly didn't hear of Master Max She. He was 50 to 1, running an 11 horse race at Leopardstown. No, um, I... Now, he's already a six year old. So, yeah. what was what happened before all of that? He had a lot of issues and a lot of problems, and Tom McCarthy and John Sheehan had him. And... They contacted me one day and they said they had a horse there that had plenty of problems. And I just bought him off him and I solved a lot of the problems, really. He had wind problems and his leg used to swell up and different things. And, you know, so... Okay, if he had a wind problem, what what was your... Like, what was your kind of... Um, if You you know, if you hear a horse has a wind issue, you're, you'd run a mile in terms of owning them or whatever. But what were you... Like, what was your kind of um, prognosis or... <laughs> well, I took him to a vet and he did him for the wind. Mm. Can I just and he go? Said he'd be successful. Mm. Can I go back to the bit where the lads contacted you and because they obviously you must have a track record of taking horses that have problems. I just have a track record of taking problems. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that in the second half of the show. Getting back to the horse now. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, I'm only joking. Um, no, look, I mean, they told me they had a horse there, and I didn't really ask them what they were doing from before that, so. But they, did they know they weren't selling you a dude, obviously? I'd say they thought they were selling me a dude. <laughs> 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 they weren't actually trying to oversell him either. No, in fairness, he didn't cost me a fortune. And Tom and John Sheehan, I'm very friendly with both of them. And um, we had a meal the night after he won. And the first man that ever contacted me was John Sheehan any time he won, you know? Fair enough, fair enough. And I, I guess, though, you obviously are comfortable enough taking horses that don't have, you know, I suppose, as a small trainer, as, a, as a, we're talking about here, it's a very small operation. You, you have to take risks and you have to kind of look for a bit of value where other people might have decided, oh, look, we've, we've, we're fed up with this now. Well, I suppose, you know, the big thing about this and, you know, people that are listening, and I got a text there from someone after Mash, Master Mac won and it, they said it is nice to see a horse that didn't cost over 200,000 win a grade one. Just and you know, when they'll go down to the step next Sunday above in Leopardstown, any of the other fellas aren't going to turn to Master Maxine and say, we cost more than you. This is the thing as well, because like, uh, we spoke to Ross Sullivan about this. The, the National Hunt game is kind of, it's a bit like um, professional football in the sense now, like Paddy, that. The uh, Man City will basically win because they have the money, and like it's it's really really rare for a story like Master McShee to happen, even in in the kind of vagaries of jumps race now, because all the good horses are gone before they're even like they're still minors effectively. Yeah, well, should I suppose to, you know the pe- some of the people that have a good horse and they win a pint of pint, they get a ball of money and they sell them. Mm. You know, that's really what it is. Did he look like so when you got his various problems sorted out? Did he? Didn't you work him? Were you thinking, oh wow, there's something here? It probably took me nearly a year and a half or more to kind of come up with that conclusion, you know. Wow. But you, know, you must look at like that. I have nothing to base him on. I have no yardstick, and you know. Who'd ride him out then? I ride him out myself. So you have to say, Paddy, what do you make of this lad? I'm not sure, Paddy. What do you think of him? And then you talk to yourself because you're trainer, man, everything going. Well, I talk to myself a lot, but not all the time. <laughs> but <laughs> I do. but I, I, when I put Jimmy Maloney up in him, Jimmy is an ex-jockey. Right. And Jimmy, has he's, he's the work rider as such, and he'd have a good idea of how good or bad they are not, you know? So he goes to the first bumper behind Run for Oscar, who's a good horse. Runs okay. Were you happy with the first run? I blame myself a little bit because I was star for a run and I kind of had him overcooked a bit. Mm. Left him off then until November. And I actually remember the race well because appreciated it was an unbelievably short price. And you pulled, you were basically leading for much of the race and you pulled 28 lengths clear of third. That's right, yeah. What was the thought? For, like, if ever you're happy in defeat, that must be it. Oh, there's no doubt that we knew that day after that run that we we had something kind of serious enough. No, we we kind of thought going to it now that he was, he'd have a chance. Well, we had a good few quid in him to be second. Really? Yeah, but the the bookies were closed, so we were back backing online. <laughs> All right, that'll that'll do. You still get paid. 
you always have played, yeah. So then he went to Cork, and I remember like thinking, if if this fellow were trained by a more recognised trainer, he'd be like he'd be about one to five on that form. He was sent off six to five, and uh, probably a lot bigger price earlier, and one by eight and a half lengths. That's right, yeah. You see, I suppose the other thing is, and it'll probably be the same Sunday in Leopardstown. I mean, you're taking on professional trainers. Mm. You're taking on people with horses worth that have been bought for two and three and four hundred thousand. Mm. You know, and you must respect those people. They put a lot of work into it and they put a lot of time into it. And I have no disrespect whatsoever for those. And But the one thing about, you know, we say the favourite is just trained by the top trainer in the country. But we're not going to tell Master McShee that. He won't know that. And after the after the Leopardstown win, then I, I I vaguely recall that there was plenty of chat like this horse is worth a good bit of money. And is, when is this? Sorry, this, this is, is for it was over a year ago. Okay, yeah. So he went, he beat C. Ducker, who's obviously that's really solid form uh, at Leopardstown handicap hurdle, which brought his mark up to one hundred and forty three. But I presume at that stage, um, the dream could have basically ended for you anyway, when you could have just cashed in. Yeah, but I, I kind of made it clear the day he won in Cork. Um, <laughs> Kevin O'Reilly asked me, is he for sale? And I said, no. Mm. And, you know, Brian Gleeson asked me the same story, and I said, no. So, you can't just buy something that's not for sale. Well, let me ask you about that. Did you know you were going to say no when you were asked it, or was it a surprise to yourself as well? You know, I don't do too much thinking about what I'm going to say. That's a big problem with me. (laughs) Mm. I don't think it's a problem at all, Paddy. But uh, do you know what I mean? Sometimes you, you don't know the answer to a question until somebody actually says it. And you're like, Jesus, I said no, flat out. I was like, okay, I've talked myself into that position now. Was there a bit of that? Or were you, you're like, I have no, something here, I want to keep it. I'm spontaneous. I just didn't have my mind made up what I was going to do. But, you know, the other thing I look at is, you know, the happiness and the enjoyment. And you can go into any shop in the world and any of them don't sell happiness or enjoyment. Mm. You know, so like that in itself, it, it can't be bought. That's and like you sell him, you get a ball of money from him. Well, do you go looking for another one, spend it all, or do you keep what you have? Well, I've just started watching Succession, and like um, money doesn't necessarily bring you happiness anyway. Like, this, I well, don't know. See, like, the richest man in Ireland is not necessarily the happiest man in Ireland. Not at all, not at all. And like, uh, it's just that story behind it. And, and the beauty of, of having a horse like that is it's it, the race itself doesn't take very long, but it's just there's so much build up to everything and there's so much fun having him around, I suppose. That's right. Well, look, I, I've said this to Phil the other day, you know, the win in Limerick, I reckon, put 10 years onto my life. And the celebrations took two off it, so I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look. <laughs> it could be six after, after Leopardstown, but anyway. My Racing Moment is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Share every racing moment. Visit hri.ie or follow Horse Racing Ireland on social media. Let's talk about that win in detail at Limerick, because if, if anybody hasn't seen this, and they might not have, it's the Faheen Novices Chase around Christmas time. And uh, I just watched it back there this, this, this afternoon, and... Uh, you don't think he was up to you? Well, you're you're sixth. You're sixth for a good bit of it, and like I know, obviously, that he's coming from sixth to win. So you can you talk us through your recollections of the race and how you're feeling as it goes? Well, you know, even though he was sixth, but he was jumping exceptionally well, and Ian had him in a he had him in a super place all throughout the race, and that was kind of what Ian and myself discussed. Well, Ian does what he likes. But we kind of discussed the race, how it would pan out and stuff. And uh, he was jumping so well and he was at his ease. Uh, I suppose everyone thought he didn't get up, including the commentator. But, you know, we were delighted that he did. And as the race unfolds, what are you thinking? Why Why did it uh, take 10 years off your life? <laughs> well, the enjoyment of... I said it put 10 years on. 10 years on, on. yeah, okay, yeah. Geez, sorry, yeah. Don't be, don't be taking uh, years away. This is a 16-year <laughs> swing there in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, but the enjoyment of it. I mean, if you're playing a county final, you know, you're, you're thrilled. If you win a golf tournament, you're thrilled. And it all makes the enjoyment that bit better to win, you know? Of course. It's also the. I just, like, did, so when he crosses the line, did, did you have any sort of inclination? Maybe, maybe have a chance here. Uh, there was a man just talking to me as he crossed the line, he said, You have it. Mm. I, I didn't actually see, I didn't realise it at the time, that I, but I wasn't worried. You know, when he goes out there and runs a good race and comes home safe, 
that's a bonus in itself, you know. This is bear in mind though, this is like a second chase start and he's winning a grade one. Yes, I suppose it was probably a brave call or a stupid call at the time before the race to put him into a grade one, but when the race was over, it was probably a brave call, you know. Well, you can be absolutely sure if he suffers like an injury, or if, let's say he suffers any sort of injury, but a fatal injury, what what the hell was he doing running in that race? He was a bloody Egypt, and that's the after time that you get. Yeah, but look, you can get killed crossing the road. Mm. So if you're mm. looking at life that way, you're at nothing. I mean, you put your heart out there and you expect him to win. When you're playing sports yourself, you, you can't look at it that way. You can get hurt and, you know, that's sport, like. It's but it's it's not only the story of you and the horse. The story of Ian Power as well. I remember Ian riding like years and years ago. Hadn't heard from him in years. Like what his story as well just adds to the whole narrative. Well, of course, he he just went on the building sites for a while and he gave up racing and it's like if I give you up holding your football and then he comes back to that after a few years again and something similar with Ian. You know, Joseph O'Brien has asked like he's hoping to bring in the. What was the series in Formula One again? The Drive to Survive. Drive to Survive. So there, obviously, there are talks of that happening in racing. You imagine, imagine your story surely worth a documentary, anyway. Yeah, well, I don't think, you know, I'm just happy enough to blow the way along and <laughs> win a few races, and I'm happy enough with that. Well, he's know? only raced nine times, so there's, like, there's a long, long way to go here. I'd hope. Well, I was just I was about to say. So we yeah. earlier when Johnny was going chronologically through it, that that was the hurdling career. You're now in the chasing career, and sorry, is is the horse eight or nine? Is that about right? That would be about right, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. So you've a good two, three years left of top quality chasing, and maybe longer. Just trying. I have, and I suppose the other thing is like he, he's. He's not very exposed over hurdles, so there'd be nothing stop me to go back to um, grade two or three hurdle as well, you know. Mm. But is, is he better chasing? He's a better jumper than mm. most. So how was the celebration like then after Limerick? Um, I think the pubs closed at eight o'clock. What time did you finish? <laughs> the publican came out and he said, come in, lads, we're closing. <laughs> <laughs> a publican who no. shall not be named <laughs> well actually golf case they got away with it no, so it doesn't matter joking. anymore we actually went down to the pub hit three or four pints and we came home to the house and then if you glass of the wine and watched the race a hundred times yeah it's, uh, that's the thing like you can never get tired of watching a race like that again and about four o'clock Alexis said for God's sake Paddy go to bed she said <laughs> <laughs> she even started to give you out to me around four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but no, you never get tired of watching a race like that. And again, going back to money, you know, money don't buy that kind of enjoyment. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's a nice little. It's a nice little add-on to a successful story like this. What about at the weekend? Then you know, the Dublin Racing Festival. You've, you've made the point that uh, none of the other horses are going to be turning around, slagging off. Uh, <laughs> Master Mac, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, no, um, you know, I suppose anyone that uh, has a gambling perspective, they want, they want to make sure that, you know, they're they're backing an unprofessional trainer, you know, and, and maybe slightly inexperienced horse. And I, I wish anyone that puts a few quid in will get it back, but we can't guarantee it. How do you think you go? Like a carryman said to me one day, he gave me a tip and he said, remember, boy, he said, that's a tip, not a winner. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the truth of it, like, and, you know. Well, like, there will be people who put a lot of money on the favourite in the race and uh, the way he galloped the chant, the way he won uh, over the Christmas, we're, just in terms of previewing the race, uh, as a jockey, you're probably in a slightly rock and a hard place here if you're not riding the favourite because you want to... Um, you don't want him to have a solo, I suppose, but at the same time, you don't want to kill your own horse. Well, this is it, and I'm sure, you know, Ian has been foot perfect on the horse up to now, and, you know, once Ian is sitting, that, that horse, he, he'll know. Like, we're not going to cut out short to stay with him or whatever, you know, but you must look at it that we've also um, ran exceptionally well in, in a novice huddle, a grade one novice huddle, and he bust the blood vessel, and we were there turning in, you know. He's a buster as well, is he? He bust the blood vessel in that grade one novice huddle. So what did you do with that? Oh, I suppose well, I changed a few things around and we we're training from out in the field and changed his feed and changed his haylage and different things like that, you know. It's mad, like, for... Th this horse defied an awful lot of things where he wouldn't say he's ticked the box here or whatever to be the horse he is. 
Yeah, but I suppose the biggest problem with that, and from from a gambling perspective, you know, that's hanging over them all the time, mm. and we don't know. And, and any trainer will tell you this: it's not a nice thing, and you never know when it can happen. Mm. So then, it's 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 not that it's house money, but uh, the success is is extra. It's it's added value when you've got that concern and that worry. If you know, if the horse is healthy and comes out healthy after the weekend, what's the rest of the year look like? What are you thinking of? Um, I suppose Fairy House or Punches Town, if the ground will be, and the, the, you know the way the weather be you now, there could be a lot of rain come around that time. And if he gets soft the ground, he's he's probably a better horse than a lot of horses in soft ground. You know. Is there a plan or a, a dream of Cheltenham at all? Yeah, maybe next year. You know, I might go to a smaller race in Cheltenham and I have a little bit of a. Um, dip my toe in the water as they say and see with how Master Mike would travel and see how I travel myself. Why why, why not this year though? Well, I, I, I'm looking at it. If I can't beat him at the Dublin Racing Festival and it's only 200 miles away from home, I, there's no point in going six or 700 miles to beat him, is there? Well, you might necessarily be running against him. Well, sure, more than likely you'll be taking on in novice chases like in a two miles five, you'll be taking on some of the same company. Like, I'll be honest with you, we, at this point in time, we don't really know how good is Master Mac. Mm. Now, if all goes well on Sunday and he doesn't bust and he jumps well and stays and he's in good form, we might have a little bit of a better result Sunday evening, you know? What does Shelton mean to you? Because... Um it's obviously the holy grail for so many people. Not for everyone either, you know. People might be just as happy to win a race in Tremor on New Year's Day. Yeah, look, I, I'm not being disrespectful to Cheltenham, but I, used, I was going to England for years buying selling track, uh, buying tractors over there and bring him home and get on the boat and spend four hours rocking over and back and get on over and spend four hours rocking home. And It's not the be-all and end-all to me now. The festival is brilliant, but... Mm. Taking a horse over there and going with that hatchup, I'm not too sure. There you go. Yeah, it's. Um, I I suppose as you say, like he, you'll be a lot more um, kind of you'll have a lot more knowledge on Sunday because it is only his third chase start and he's only just after basically ending his maiden status as a chaser. Like that's right. Yeah. So like, look to be very interesting. I mean, to be honest, he, he went to Limerick and he beat a very good horse in Farouk to Lim. Mm. And you know whatever happens on Sunday. He's still he's still a grade one winner, and we have a grade one under our belt, so we'd be happy with that. Ah, look, it's a sensational story, and a week like this, do you get nervous in the build-up? Are you just excited? Is it all good, or are there little bits of you that are like watching? Uh, I the don't clock? do nerves, right? Yeah, just keep a low profile, and I have this packed. That and I said a tea in this morning that whatever happens, we we'll come home Sunday evening in roughly the same form that we went to. Yeah. As long as he's all safe and sound, like that's look. The, as long as he's safe and yeah. sound, and but even at that, you know, I mean, if you come home and win, there's no point in getting too high, and if anything goes wrong, there's no point in getting too low. So, mm, it's good, good piece of advice. You kind of have to take the go, especially in horse racing, mm. because it, it can be a very cruel sport. It's very up and down, mainly down, and both for horse and jockey. You mm. know, I'm sure. At the same time, enjoying the triumphs is also part of life's journey, and so you should definitely celebrate it. And I suspect that if you were to get an extra eight years. Uh, <laughs> on balance this weekend you'd be happy enough um, so your your day job is you're, you're a tractor mechanic is that right? Well I buy and sell tractors and we're making cows as well but my son John is farming now so Right you have a lot going on and in the midst of that you've got a superstar on your hands hopefully Hopefully yeah ah, look. You never know if Sunday he will tell us whether he's a superstar or not maybe well he is up to now because to be honest he's a lot done for us well, it's a good story. It's a great story. I'm wrong about that. It's a great story. Absolutely sensational. Congratulations on the success. We wish you an incredible 2022, Paddy, whatever happens. Thanks a million. Thanks very much, Les. Thanks for your time. All Thanks the best, for Thanks for having me. That's uh, Paddy Corkery there, who's the uh, trainer. If you haven't uh, watched the race um, from Limerick at Christmas, you should. It's uh, Master McShee getting a, a bob in the head to get over the line. Yeah, um... The, as he said the commentator got it wrong it was one of those races where it was hard to believe he got up but um, I think you know beating Jigginstone in terms of uh, the egalitarian kind of um, distribution of riches in the racing game you know nobody would be too unhappy with that it's, it's a completely mad story Ger. you know so many layers to it um, 
you know the fact that he I'm involved in a horse like that that um, switched yards and everything's going great but he's burst twice in his work now and it's it's a real real negative because it's essentially like it's, it's internal bleeding but the horse just like obviously can't um, finish out his or her race in and it's a major negative but to have a wind issue as well like and to come from basically being a, a cast off given to a fella that hardly anyone in racing had ever heard of and just said listen sure best of luck you know and next thing he's like the horse is worth an awful lot of money well that's a great story absolutely great story um, it, this is Friday Night Racing and it's brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland we're going to take a quick break we'll be back previewing the actual big races at the Dublin Racing Festival Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball and they're brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie with eight grade one races the bonus point Paddy Power Irish Gold Cup and the Chanel Farm Irish Champion Hurdle needless to say Honeysuckle is in everybody's stable this weekend's Dublin Racing Festival may finally deliver shake up in our tote 10 to follow competition it's a long way behind Johnny that myself and uh, Danny Mullins are there's only 45 points though between myself and Danny you're on 319 which uh, is 140 roughly 130 ahead of uh, Danny and Danny's 40, 49 ahead of me puts me in the top something percent of Everyone, I think. Yeah, not bad. Mm. It's good that you, all that work and all those hours end us. Kind of a bit of a Master McShee story. It's complete black sheep type thing. Just outlier stuff doesn't doesn't really make any sense. But I'll, I'll enjoy it while it lasts. Well, let us preview the uh, Paddy Power Irish Gold Cup then. Um, what's going to happen? I think if Master McShee ran in this, um, he'd have a chance. Because it's just, it's a it's a really, really weird race this year. Frodon's coming over. Um, Why can't Frodon get no love? No, Froden will get low. Froden could definitely win. Um, I think Kenboy should have his measure around Leverstown. Kenboy like has won this the last couple of years and uh, is um, he loves this track. I really liked his attitude at Christmas when he was headed by Galvin and Aplutard and like rallied all the way to the line. They don't run in this race, so that might be enough. Um, Paul Townend will have um, a horse just that absolutely relishes the demands of Leverstown, and the ground has been again. Um, it actually rained 23 days succession I think of dry uh, weather in, in Dublin in January so that sort of ground will um, will suit him but if you look at it Asterian for Lawrence he's fallen the last twice he needs to go the other way Janet doesn't really stay um, Celia Semery shouldn't be good enough Delta Work seems to be gone at the game um, you know and obviously Manella Indo so Robbie Powers riding Manella Indo because the owners seemingly said well Rachel Blackburn's not going to be riding him at Cheltenham so we'll give it to Robbie Power here amazing comeback for Robbie who's literally just back in the saddle after a bad injury um, and has a chance but he's a lot to prove as well I actually think Conflated is worth an each way bet in the race he shouldn't win but there are so many doubts about everything else Um Davy Russell riding him. He ro- couldn't have ridden the track better at Christmas in the big grade one. Uh, he's a consistent horse, not totally exposed, um, and he'd be my favourite each way in the races. I don't, anything could happen in it. What kind of prices? Complete forties. All right. Mm. Okay. So if you put five euro each way at forty to one, You'll that means zero. you get nothing back. Yeah. Um, but as like one firm is paying four places, I think he'll run his race. I think a lot of these have so many questions. Only eight runners. Half of them have massive questions against them. Okay. Uh, why are you against Kenboy and Asterian for I wouldn't Kenboy if I were Asterian for Lange has gone the wrong way and he's fallen the last twice he's a bit of a enigma of a horse at this stage Kenboy I think is a horse to beat um, Frodon in fairness he should run well um, he had a hard race the last day he was disappointing in the King George not as disappointing as Manella Indo um, Bryony Frost will obviously it'll be interesting I think she'll get a great reception if she comes in Frodon's a very popular horse won in Down Royal earlier in the year um, but it's a bit of a mad race uh, there's going to be a lot of pace in it and and uh, that could suit Conflated as well. Okay, he's down to 50s, I see, Conflated. <laughs> so, like, yeah. It's, it, I remember going going to the dog track with my mate down the years, and it was the real, real insult. You'd back, like, such a dog with the, the bookie. He'd take your money, go up, go up to the board and put him out in price after you'd backed him. It's like, well, you clearly don't... <laughs> Don't take me very seriously, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Okay. Well, what else are, do you need to talk about here about uh, Saturday? 
Uh, well, Saturday is uh, probably the, the better of the two days, I would argue. Uh, the first of the grade ones is the first race, which is Hollow Games. Probably not the strongest race in the world. Um, Freedom to Dream, Kevin Sexton have an unbelievable year. He's another 33-40-1 shot. I think has a squeak each way. He's very unexposed. Ran well at Limerick on desperate ground over the Christmas. Better of the day for me is Phil Dore in the juvenile race. Um, a lot of people would have watched Pied Piper uh, his performance at Shelton was extraordinary really last Saturday um, the typical response when you ask anyone in the yard how would you compare Field Door and Pied Piper well they never work together so we can compare them but to be fair they're, I think they are totally different horses about uh, to say something very well, I'm, profound I'm, here. well I was uh, I'm, uh, let's in a hypothetical scenario where something like that existed uh, would you say that's true or do they not actually do a lot of work together so they can they can test them themselves so they know the answer to that so generally I don't think they do work together and certainly the the, the proverbial gun wouldn't be put to their head because they wouldn't they, ra- racing is not like um, training for intercounty, for example like they just they never go all out they, they train them to get them to a certain level and then the race course that's when they go to the threshold or whatever and would um, you not be would you not learn quite a lot about working your similar standard best horses against each other yeah and like that that would be the some, three quarters of your best versus three quarters of my best let's see where we're going yeah some some yards will do it um, but in, in this case um, obviously Gordon has so many horses but these will be two different horses as well Field Door is a national hunt horse Pied Piper is a kind of a flashy flat horse right Typical sort of like ticking the boxes of what you'd expect in the juvenile division, um, but so I, is I this, wouldn't. Is this a, what a juvenile? This hurdle? is a juvenile hurdle, so for four-year-olds. But Vauban was was a mad hot favourite on his Irish baby. Was just touched off by Pied Piper, who then bolted up at Cheltenham. So the kind of the implication is that Vauban is very very good. I'm not sure why he's wearing a tongue tie. That would be a slight concern. And Field Door for me, I love the way he goes about his business. He's my my bet of the day anyway. Very short price as well. Five Six to, to four. four. Six four. It's not. It's not too bad. I, he's he's more. He's normally shorter than that. But he's a the the type of lad that's, you know, as as a friend you'd kind of love to hate because everything comes his way and he doesn't even try. That's kind of he's very relaxed, kind of laid back. Um, but does it when you does everything that you need him to do. Okay. The the talk about the watering and the number of horses that we were going to have are the fields about the right size or are yeah, you yeah no I, like his, in fairness um, you know Gordon Ennis walked the tractor in the week and was happy with it it, it was a couple of years ago there was a, an unbelievable spate of non-runners on the uh, two or three years ago I can't exactly remember on the Sunday and um, it's very very difficult for Lorcan Wire and it's been spoken about a lot in, in the build up to the meeting that Leopardstown's chase track in particular drains extremely well and obviously Which in Ireland you would have thought was like a massive advantage totally it, it, it'd be a massive advantage for a flat track but it's Leopardstown is obviously this time of year is a jumps track and um, it's funny like because the the, the the recording that there were 23 consecutive days in the Phoenix Park weather station with no rain that isn't, that's not abnormal for Dublin anymore it, it really doesn't rain that much but by extension Leopardstown has a problem that it, it they did drainage on the track 10 or 15 years ago and apparently it just it drains so well that it just it dries really quickly and they've loaded water on it for artificial water which it really is mad as a jumps track this time of year but uh uh, despite all of that, the horses that you know were, were going to turn up are essentially here. Honeysuckle is here, and um, it rained a little bit last night as well. And Gordon Elliott said like it was fine; he's no issues with it. So I hope it's it's not an issue. But it's a really tough one for the clerk, of course, because generally you shouldn't interfere with nature um, as much as you can. But nature is kind of screwed up at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So that's Saturday, Sunday. The highlight is obviously honeysuckle. There will be extra people on the gate because Honeysuckle is running. Everybody wants to go and see Honeysuckle. It yeah. looks like it's an easier race for Honeysuckle this year than last year. Yeah, like it's. I, I'd implore people to go racing this weekend, particularly the fact that um, you know it's just we've waited so long for meetings like this, and you know I think the likes of Gallop and Deschamps run and that. And Honeysuckle, let's be honest, this isn't a great renewal of the race at all. She's taken on Zana here and horses that are nowhere near good enough, and Zana here is not good enough. Um, I appreciate it was going to run, doesn't run. Um, but to be fair, there are opposition to Honeysuckle in general is 10 on the ground anyway and I just would love to see her finish her career unbeaten um, and I'm not saying they should retire her but it's I think it's a beautiful thing that she has she's an amazing horse she just uh I don't know what it is. People like me have opposed her from time to time. She's too hard. She's too short in the betting. Um, you know, she's she didn't win by much the last day. Track won't be suitable. Blah 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 blah. But she always does it. Um, and she has this extreme like, I'm the I'm the guard here. I'm the I'm the dude. Like I'm the I'm the 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 
king of the stable here and like basically I'm the boss and she races like that and her story with Rachel Blackmore we saw the documentary about Rachel before the Christmas has been unbelievable for racing at a time when it needed it okay so but that is a uh uh, un, unopposable definitely oh, yeah. she's bar if something goes spectacularly wrong she's a 6 to 1 on shot or something like that I, okay. uh, I, of all the races nobody wants hardly anyone wants to see her beaten anyway yeah it, I'm seeing 11 4 on, uh, in one place uh, just to go back briefly I mean obviously we, we talked about Master McShee a little bit earlier on Galloping Deschamps is 2 to 1 on around that Master McShee is 6 to 1 uh, do, you, do you give Matthew McShee a chance of overturning Gallop in the Champ? No, um, Gallop in the Champ was not only a very good hurdler, but his his jumping technique at Christmas was um, had everybody looking for a superlative afterwards, including Willie Mullins, who was really, really, um, you know, just full of praise for the horse performance afterwards. And bear in mind, like, the race was so good with all the great ones over the Christmas. This was a maiden chase. And I, I think his performance was talked about almost more than anything. Um, it was absolutely spectacular as I spoke about there with Paddy if you're a jockey um, I, I think jockeys get a lot of crap from you know armchair punters who are saying oh he gave him too much rope he gave him this he gave him that he gave her this he gave her that um, if you go after this horse you could cost yourself quite a bit in terms of you could end up the horse falling because he's legless because he's gone after the pace Galvin Deschamps is going to go off hard here and maintain a strong gallop and the rest of them it'll be a game of cat and mouse to try to finish second I think for 30 grand um, because it shouldn't be good enough to beat him as much as Fury Road was good at Christmas if you are a bookmaker this is a horse you should take on because the hype machine is so much that you're almost inclined to think he's unbeatable and he's probably not unbeatable here but I, ca- I can't oppose him he was breathtaking at Christmas OK anything else that you want to talk about on um, I guess Shaq and Pursois return in the Labrooks chase um, a lot of eyes on that because he bombed out in the Tingle Creek more than willing to give him another chance um, I I think he's well worth the bet you're back in, you're, I think he's about 8 to 11 you're essentially betting on him running his race because if he does that he'll win um, he's won the race the last couple of years and apart from that then we have uh, Ver- Sir Gerhard who I'm really looking forward to seeing I think he's a great I, I, I definitely back him I think he's extremely exciting he reminds me of O'Connor hopefully lasts longer than O'Connor did by Jeremy as well um, a horse that may step up and trip at Chelton to avoid his stalemate Dice or Diamond but at the moment um, well, I think he's a great bet in the 335 him and Field Door would be my double for the weekend All right. So and what can what can go wrong the way my 10 to follow is going at the moment it's fairly sensational visit tote.ie to avail of the tote guarantee on all Irish and UK racing and of course you can't bet uh, at the track at Leopardstown on Saturday and Sunday as well um, were you at the National Gallery? I was actually yeah um, Jack B. Yates yeah it was a lot of real ra- real racing team to his stuff actually like I'm not um, obviously no connoisseur but uh, you know what you like it's uh, the funny thing is if you like so there were three or four rooms of Jack B. Yates stuff so like he his, his catalogue was incredible like he was well into his 80s he was still and like so he I think he had 600 odd paintings or whatever now we're only selection them there but you're really doing them a total disservice by just looking at them and moving on because you could look at one painting for two hours and be discovering things all the time with it and the horsey stuff was stunning, like really was and I know racing's well suited for um, artwork but uh, his stuff would just, it would amaze you and um, yeah, I, I, I actually, I, maybe some people listening will know the answer to this and I was at Leopardstown when he won as a two-year-old. Was Yates named after him or his brother? I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know. There's one for Mrs. Sue Magner and so on. I'd say Ivan thought it was after himself. Um, well, it's different spelling. Nice dig, though. It's good when you, it's good when you explain the joke, Johnny. <laughs> That's no, the it always joke. helps. Um, <laughs> uh, did you know that Barney Eastwood was a prolific buyer of art? I and, did. And owned a load of Jack B. Yeats and Lucian Freud stuff. And that uh, Freud's. Freud gave him a load of paintings in payment for bets that he was making. Wow. That there was like, that's how they ended up getting a lot of the, the work at the start. It was like, I should give me a painting and we call it quits. Wow. And it, uh, Barney's um, business partner was good mates with Freud and uh, and that artwork all turned out to be worth like tens of millions. Each piece was like, just this explosive value. The the Donnellys as well, who own uh, Asterian for Lawrence, uh, among others, um, massive, massive collectors of artwork as well. Um, but the, the funny thing about that today was that uh, it was literally, it was 
bumper to bumper in terms of people because I think the, the exhibition closes maybe tomorrow yeah. um, and obviously there must have been COVID restrictions um, but people were I guess if you're into art this is like the holy grail to have all this stuff available in the National Gallery which itself is a stunning building has the, to be said. the sports element of that is definitely something that we should have been talking about to tell everybody to go to this but we're mm. very late for this You'd still, I, you can make I a good just, weekend of it Arthur's like I told you months ago uh, Arthur, Arthur Rodi should get a mention here because he was the one who advised me to do this in the first place he also advised me to go to Endgame the best could play that's been played that's been delayed whatever it's going to be played um, so the man is of great taste he's also the, the Sligo connection with Yates probably not to be uh, it was Jack B. Yates who Yates was named after is that what you're telling me no you don't know okay alright we, I, there are definitely people I, I don't know the answer to this Yates um, who's a, a sire of some of many of the horses running at the weekend who is he named after well, we shall find out for next week. I know that uh, the audience is bated breath and they're all texting in this stage, 53106. That is this week's episode of Friday Night Race. And we hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. We got some wit and wisdom from Paddy Corkery a little bit earlier on. And uh, I, for one, am definitely uh, hoping and cheering for him this weekend to see if that victory can add another eight years to his life. We'll see you next Friday afternoon. Take care. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie